Good morning, Redeemer. I have a few announcements. Uh, so we have a new director of music beginning uh, in November, but we will have choir on Wednesday. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated in the trunk or treat. It was a huge success. We do have a few bags left over. If anyone's interested, please meet us after worship and we'll, we'll share that with you. Also, uh, we still have five council positions available. So speak to Jim Drennan. He'll be happy to share with you anything you may have as, as far as questions go. Also, we will remind you of the new Bible studies that are uh, coming up and the, and the times they are in the bulletin. Uh, one more thing, the life screening is still available. If you'll call the 1-800 number, uh, you can get the information, and it is going to be for November the 8th. Any other announcements for anyone? But okay, Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Reformation Day. I invite, I invite you to stand, stand at this time as we enter into worship. worship. Blessed, Blessed be the, be the Holy, Holy Trinity, Trinity, one God, God who, who greets us in this and every season, season whose word never, never fails, fails, whose promise, promise is sure. sure. Amen. Amen. If we say we, we have, have no sin, sin we, deceive we deceive ourselves, ourselves and the and truth, the truth is, is not in us. In Let us confess us our sin to God, who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, have mercy on us. We confess to you that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not trusted you with our whole heart. We have not loved one another in deed and in truth. In your compassion, forgive our sin and so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our light and our truth. Amen. With joy, I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy and abundant in love, forgives you all your sin and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray the prayer of the day together. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunited for the sake of your son jesus christ our savior who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god now and forever amen you may be seated The first reading is from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel these days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Psalm 46 will be read responsibly. God is our refuge and strength, a very pleasant help in trouble. Though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. in the midst of the city, it shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still, then, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts. 
host is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The second reading is from the third chapter of Romans. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are, who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are not justified by his grace as a gift through redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God puts forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated and the children and young at heart may come forward. Can get ourselves around. <laughs> I, I have two questions for you. First, what does Reformation mean? What does the word Reformation mean? Get better, change, made new. If you break it apart, it actually means to be reformed, remade, made new. So what was reformed in the Reformation that we celebrate today? Our understanding of God and his relationship with us, the way the church was working, was made new. It was brought back to biblical understanding, the way we feel, and made new. How Are we still being reformed? We need to be. Anybody feel they don't need to be reformed in any way? Come and talk to me. Uh, <laughs> you can share your secrets with me. Um, the other question is part of, part of being reformed is knowing the truth and being set free. What does freedom mean? What does freedom mean? Do you know, Lily? What is it? Don't want it? Okay. okay. Anyone else? Not, not to be a slave to, uh, to be able to express in any way you want. Not to not be a slave, to be able to express how you want. 
right? The ability to make your own choices and decisions. We are, what is our slogan? The land of the free and the home of the brave. That is political freedom. We have religious freedom. The freedom Jesus is talking about is freedom from sin. It's freedom from enslavement to sin because he says, if you sin, you're a slave to it. So he takes that away. He breaks that and makes us no longer slaves to sin. And then we really do know the truth, which is that we are free to love God and be children of God. And we are, we are free from sin, free for, free to become children of God. Does that make sense? So we, think of, we tend to think of freedom as freedom from. I'd like us to start thinking of it also as freedom for. Let's pray. Good and gracious God. Excuse me. Good and gracious God. On this Reformation Day, help us to remember what it is to be reformed in your image, to know your truth so that we are truly set free, set free from slavery to sin, set free to serve you as your children. Just keep walking with us, Lord, because we can't do any of this without you. It's in your most holy name that we pray. Amen. Sound effect. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, from Jesus the Christ our Lord and Savior, and from the Holy Spirit our Advocate and Guide. Amen. Today is Reformation Sunday, if you can't tell from all the red, which commemorates an important day in our faith history as Martin Luther's posting of the 95 Theses set off a seismic shift in the Christian Church as Protestants split away from the Roman Catholic Church and new denominations were born and formed. This was a radical transformation, the results of which are still in full effect today. And all of our readings talk about such radical transformation or reformation, beginning with the word from the prophet Jeremiah. Our reading comes from the section of Jeremiah that is known as either the little book of comfort or the book of consolation which offers a word of hope for the people in exile. They were experiencing a true crisis of faith, as their defeat and exile from the promised land had caused them to question both their belief in the one true God and his love for them. We need to remember that people back then believed that losing a war meant that the winning army was following the stronger God. So they wondered if there was indeed another God out there that might be stronger than their own. And even if that were not the case, which we know it is not, did their defeat and exile mean that God had stopped loving them and no longer wanted them to be his chosen people? These are heart-wrenching, deep questions. We know that their fears were groundless, for God is always faithful. But the people needed to hear this truth in their dark moments of exile. So God sent Jeremiah to them to remind them of his love and the relationship that he still wanted to have with them. Because they had been unable or unwilling to keep the covenant he had made with them at Sinai, God would now make a new covenant with them. But this time, God will prevent them from breaking the covenant by writing it on his people's hearts instead of on stone tablets. God has apparently decided that it is because of a lack of knowledge of him that the people have been either unwilling or unable, or maybe both, to keep the previous covenants. As the NRSV Student Bible Study says, the written law did not have the power to transform people's inner attitudes. So God will bring about inner transformation by changing our very hearts. And then he goes on to say that no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. 
the important thing here is that this is all God's doing. It is his own forgiveness that will open the way for this new covenant and this new way for his people to know him. Notice that God does not promise merely to be indifferent to iniquity or wrongdoing. Rather, God promises to end iniquity by altering the human heart. And this, of course, speaks of a reformation of us as human beings that will, as a direct consequence, bring about a reformation of our relationships with one another and with God. Clearly, this writing on our hearts has not yet fully happened. As we do still need to have people teach us about our faith, and we do still falter in our discipleship and our ability to stay true to answering God's call on our lives. The truth is that we are living in the in-between times, or the already but not yet times, in which the promises of this new covenant have been made, but are not yet fully realized. But we, like the ancient Israelites, still have hope. For we too have heard the message that the days are surely coming, says the Lord. Now this phrase may sound ominous, because we're not quite sure what those coming days will bring with them, other than change, and change tends to be really scary for a lot of people. In this case, though, God is not speaking of another defeat or exile, but the inauguration of an era of unprecedented peace with God and with one another. We hear another vision of this coming peace in Psalm 46, which is read on Reformation Sunday because it is the basis for Martin Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress. As we sing that hymn next, I want you to, I want you to compare the verses to the psalm in your head. They are all there. Psalm 46 is a beautiful psalm that talks about God's faithfulness, his creative power, and his vision for the future. The images are powerful and potentially terrifying. But again, we are reassured that we need not fear. For God is our refuge and our strength. He is our fortress, our stronghold, our safe place, a very present help in trouble. God is faithful, and God is always with us. In these days of unprecedented news coverage that allows us to hear almost instantaneously about wars and mass shootings and natural disasters and, and you know the rest, it just keeps coming. Whatever else is going on all around the world and locally, it can be hard to feel God's presence or even to remember that God is still with us. But this psalm serves as a constant reminder that though the earth be moved and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea, though its waters rage and foam and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, God is here. You may be familiar with this story, but I think it is worth repeating here. Barrett Kios in his book, A Wardrobe from the King, writes, Long ago a man sought the perfect picture of peace. Not finding one that satisfied, he announced a contest to produce this masterpiece. The challenge stirred the imagination of artists everywhere, and paintings arrived from far and wide. Finally, the great day of revelation arrived. The judges uncovered one peaceful scene after another, while the viewers clapped and cheered. The tensions grew. Only two pictures remained veiled. As a judge pulled the cover from one, a hush fell over the crowd. A mirror-smooth lake reflected lacy green birches under the soft blush of the evening sky. Along the grassy shore, a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. Surely this was the winner. But then the man with the vision uncovered the second painting himself, and the crowd gasped in surprise. Could this be peace? A tumultuous waterfall cascaded down a rocky precipice. The crowd could almost feel its cold penetrating spray. Stormy gray clouds threatened to explode with lightning, wind, and rain. And in the midst of the thundering noises and bitter chill, a spindly tree clung to the rocks at the edge of the falls. One of its branches reached out in front of the torrential waters as if foolishly seeking to experience its full power. And a little bird had built a nest in the elbow of that branch. Content and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, she rested 
on her eggs. With her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones, she manifested peace that transcends all earthly turmoil. This is certainly a peace that we can all envision and that we long so desperately for. And the psalmist goes on to describe a peace Describe that peace on an even greater scale, writing that we are to regard the works of the Lord, what desolations God has brought upon the earth. Again, this phrase sounds ominous, as desolation typically means destruction, devastation, or complete emptiness. But in this case, the desolation to be brought by God is the destruction of the implements of war, which will result in war ceasing all around the world. This is the lasting peace that we hope for, especially on days when we hear of atrocities being committed in Israel and Ukraine and the mass shooting that happened in Lewiston, Maine. Clearly, the weapons of war have not yet been destroyed, but we still are comforted when we hear God say, be still then and know that I am God. Not because we can go to some quiet place to meditate or pray, but because God, the one who will fully bring his kingdom here and make all wars to cease is already here and at work in and through us and our neighbors. We may need to search a little harder for words of reformation and peace in Paul's letter to the Romans, but they are there. This time, though, the focus is not so much on worldly peace, but on peace with God or reformed relationship with God what Paul calls being justified. And again, this is something that can only be accomplished by God. Paul begins by reminding us that no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. In other words, the law does not offer us a pathway to salvation. It serves to show us where we have fallen short or missed the mark, which is a good definition of what it means to sin. The only way we are brought into right relationship with God is through the faithfulness of Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. We read verse 22 as the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But there's a little word in Greek, en, which can mean in or of. So this can also be translated as through the faith of Jesus Christ. And this changes everything. Because suddenly it is not about our faith that makes us righteous or saves us, but the faith of Jesus that does that for us. As I said in Bible study this week, if my salvation is dependent on my faith or faithfulness, then I am doomed. For as strong as I feel my faith to be, it is insufficient to bring about such a result. And what's more, reading this as our faith makes faith into a work that must be accomplished in order for us to be saved, which takes God's great gift of grace completely out of the equation. The truth is that it is through the amazing grace of God and the faithfulness of Jesus the Christ that we are saved. And it is through that grace and faithfulness that we have been gifted with our own faith, the faith that God has planted in each of us and continues to nurture with the gift of the Holy Spirit, who lives within and among us. So maybe this new way of reading this chapter of Romans is the reformation that we are to take from it. After all, as Martin Luther came to realize, and as we know so well as Lutherans, we are saved by grace and not by works of law. Or we are saved by grace through faith alone. But we can now hear the truth that this salvation is the result of grace and the faith of Jesus rather than our own. And that is hugely good news. And this discovery of truth leads us to our gospel reading in which Jesus was talking with the Jews who had believed in him. This is a good reminder that we are dealing with a Jewish community and disputes within that community. And that Jesus and his disciples were Jews as well. But Jesus is quick to point out that their ancestry does not give them a free pass. It is not something for them to just fall back on. Yes, they are descended from Abraham, 
but it is what they do now that matters. And what they must do now is to continue in his word. Actually, it would be better translated as abide in his word. Abide is a much stronger word as it means to dwell deeply and for a long time in Jesus' word or the word that is Jesus, rather than just continuing to do something. If you abide in my word. The Jewish people take issue with Jesus' statement that they will then know the truth and the truth will make them free. They hear this as meaning that they are not free now. So they rather absurdly, given their Jewish history, claim that they have never been slaves to anyone. Apparently they have forgotten their enslavement in Egypt and their oppression and enslavement by the Romans and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and so many others. But Jesus corrects this misunderstanding by saying that he is not speaking of them being enslaved by another, but the fact that everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Clearly, they could have no argument here, for they and we all sin. Jesus then reminds them that slaves have no permanent place in the household. Slaves can be bought and sold at any time. Their future in the household is never secure but sons and daughters do have a permanent place. And we, remembering that we are reading from the Gospel of John, this brings us right back to his prologue, in which he says, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh or of the will of man, but of God. So we, once again, we see the transformation, or better today, the reformation of our very identities from slaves to sin to children of God. On this Resurrect Reformation Sunday, we are reminded over and over again of what Jesus accomplished through his death and resurrection and of the many ways in which God is reforming us so that we can help him to reform the world. My prayer is that this reformation, this reformation, will be completed soon. Amen.
Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God, our reformer, you make all things new. Free us from complacency. Open us to an unexpected way. Heal the church's many divisions. Unite us in one body through the love of Christ. And kindle zeal in us for the future of our church. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, our creator, your hands have made the heights of the mountains and the depths of the sea, and the light that animates all creation. Bring relief to areas harmed by wildfires, floods, storms, and human carelessness. Renew the face of the earth. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, our ruler, the nation raised and the kingdom shake, that your word stands fast forever. Let your justice and peace roll down like waters wherever there is strife, injustice, war, or religious conflict, especially in Israel, Ukraine, and Sudan. Be with all members of the military, first responders, and their families. Defend them with your heavenly grace. Give them the courage to face whatever dangers they may encounter and continue to hold them close wherever they may be. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, our comforter, we turn to you in our distress following yet another mass shooting, this time in May. Our hearts ache for the families of those who have been injured and for lost lives. We pray for all whom this act of violence has impacted. May your light shine on those communities that are now filled with fear, sorrow, and anger. May health care workers and counselors be guided by you as they strive to bring comfort in this moment of terror. Despite all the hatred and fear surrounding us, may your love prevail. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, our champion, you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Draw near to all who suffer, especially those on our prayer list, and those whom we may now either allow or in the silence of our hearts. We pray also as Jesus taught us those people we find hard to love. Reconcile us with them and grant us the peace that only you can bring. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, our Savior, you made yourself known in the lives of all who have died in the hope of your grace. 
We give thanks for the witness of the reformers like Martin Luther and for all people whose example has brought us closer to you. God of grace, hear our prayer. For what and for whom else would people of God pray today? All people God of grace, hear our prayer. God of grace, hear our prayer. Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a sign of the Lord's peace.
let us pray. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow his way of humble service and love. And so with the church on earth, all creation, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. You are indeed holy, gracious, and merciful God. Everything is filled with your glory. We give you thanks for your promise and presence which have sustained the faithful in this and every generation. Above all, we give you thanks for Jesus, born of Mary, who in word and deed announced your gentle rule of justice, reconciliation, and peace. On the night in which he was handed over to a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remembering his command to love one another, his life and death, his resurrection and his ascension, we pray for his coming again, even as we exclaim, Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that all of your promises may come to us and your whole creation. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Jesus invites you to his table. Come, eat, and live. You may be seated. For those worshiping with us at home, this is the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you.
We stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray together. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The God of glory, Je Jesus Christ's name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Peace. God is at work in you. Thanks be to God.